All right, we're going to do a study today on the New Testament word peace. And the name of this video is going to be When Peace is Caught Up from the Earth. So that sounds like the catching away of the body of Christ. That's the point exactly. Um, it's going to be a profound study, but yet at the end you're going to realize how simple it is to understand all this if you're genuinely saved. Uh, saved Christians understand this because we have the peace of God that passeth understanding. Lost people don't understand. Saved people do. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. Now, if you study the word peace, you will realize that every single one of the Pauline epistles, from Romans the Hoy to Philemon, they all start with a promise of peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you can go to these if you want, or write them down if you're taking notes. Romans chapter 1, verse 7. I'm just gonna, gonna read down through them. If you want to turn your King James Bible to see, make sure I'm telling you the truth, you can. Um, but I'm just gonna read through them for sake of time. Romans chapter 1, verse 7. Um, and I'm just giving the part where it says about peace. Peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. Peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 1, verse 3. Peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 2. Peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, verse 2. Peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 1, verse 2, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Slightly different word order, but same thing. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our, or, and Christ Jesus our Lord. Excuse me. Titus chapter 1, verse 4, Peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. I thought that was interesting. Philemon 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 3, Peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Um, now let's go to the book of Hebrews. So we went through the Pauline epistles, and we saw every single Pauline epistle starts with a promise of peace to the Christian. Okay, so here we are, Hebrews chapter 1. Um, let's see where the uh, promise of peace is. Um, hmm. uh, it's not there in the first couple of verses, uh, maybe in verse 7 down through verse 14. Uh, yeah, it's not there. Isn't it strange that all the Pauline epistles begin with a promise of peace, and yet you hit the book of Hebrews? And there's no promise of peace. I wonder what happened. It's almost as if Paul is writing to a group of people and you get to the end of that time period, the church age, if you will, and all of a sudden Hebrews show up, which isn't for church age because in the church age there's neither Jew nor Gentile. We're all one in Christ Jesus, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. And all of a sudden this group called Hebrews shows up and there's no promise of peace. Hmm. Is there any mention of peace in the book of Hebrews? Yeah. Let's look at those. It appears four times. The word peace appears four times in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 7. And ironically, it's kind of funny because you say, well, it's just a different author or whatever. Well, some people will have different theories about who wrote Hebrews. I personally believe that it was the Apostle Paul. So Paul writing to Christians, peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, Paul, now it's time to write to the Hebrews. Hi. God who at sundry times and divers manner spake in past, times past to the Father. Where's the peace at, Paul? Well, peace is mentioned. Let's see about it. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually." 
Jesus Christ appeared as the Son of God, as this Melchizedek, King of, Sa King of Salem. He appeared like that in the Old Testament. You're just told about that right here in this passage. That's why you have in the uh, fiery furnace there with Nebuchadnezzar, he looks and he sees Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the furnace, and he says, didn't we put, cast three people in there? Three men in there? But I see a, a fourth one in there walking around, and the form of the fourth is like unto the Son of God. Who was it? Made like unto the Son of God. Verse 3. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 3. It's talking about Jesus Christ in a pre-incarnate form. And, you know, the, I'm sure the non-dispensationalists are excited right now. They're probably going, see, he was there. He died on the cross from the foundation of the world. He was there. They put their faith in Jesus, the Son of God. You know, People are nuts. Uh, no, he didn't die on the cross back, you know, before Genesis chapter 1, okay? Um, that is an event that happened there in the first century. Nobody was getting saved by putting their faith in Jesus Christ and, you know, Adam and Eve didn't have faith in Christ or something like this. His death, burial, and resurrection. Yeah. But there we see one of the references to the word peace in the book of Hebrews. It's a reference to Jesus Christ. Is there a promise to them that they can have that peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ? Is there a promise of peace to them? Nope. It's talking about Jesus. Let's look at the next reference to peace in the book of Hebrews. Go to chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31. It says here, By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not, when she had received the spies with peace. Uh, is that peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ? No. It just simply means that she got these spies, you know, these Jewish spies, the two men there, and she hid them and uh, kept peace with them. She didn't turn them over to the authorities and stuff and saved her people and whatever else, you know. Nope. Uh, again, is that a reference to peace that a Christian has? No, it isn't. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Next reference. Follow peace with all men with, and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. So, in a secular sense, we'll say, you're to be at peace with all men. Don't be a troublemaker and things like that. Is that the same thing as promised to a Christian? Peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ? Nope. That's an action. That's something that you should do. You should try to be at peace with your fellow man. Hmm. And finally, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. The last reference to peace in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20 and 21. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Um, well, you say, um, how about that? Well, no, it's actually a reference to the God of peace. It's not a promise of that peace coming to you if you were a Hebrew in the time of Jacob's trouble which is what the whole book of Hebrews is all about. Hebrews and James are for the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God, and to the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. When do the twelve tribes come back? Revelation chapter 7. That's when the twelve tribes are recognized again by the Lord. I believe that they're there. I believe that they exist right now. But God isn't going to you know, formally recognize them until the body of Christ is gone. Why? Again, think about this. Neither is neither Jew nor Greek. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Here are the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Huh? How does that work? The Lord's dealing with 12 tribes. Revelation 7, 12 tribes. But there's neither Jew nor Greek. We're all one in Christ Jesus. How does that work? You have... God dealing with 12 tribes here and, and Jews and things and, you know, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. But over here he's saying there's neither Jew nor Greek. Something has to happen that stops 
where God's saying neither Jew nor Greek, and now he's going back to the Jews. It's catching away of the body of Christ. James chapter 2, verse 15. What about the book of James? Is there any reference in here to peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ? Being that this, these books, Hebrews and James, are for Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble? I'll just answer it. No, there isn't. Now let me prove it. James chapter 2, verse 15. If a brother or a sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what, what doth it profit? Remember what we read back there in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, about following peace with all men and things like that. Somebody comes to you, a neighbor comes to you, and you say, Depart in peace, and you don't give them the things that they need. See? It's not what we have as Christians today. <clears throat> James chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. So, what do they get? You say, well, they get peace from above. They get God's peace. You see, peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. It's not what it says. The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable. The wisdom that God gives them. What is that wisdom? <clears throat> the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. They live at peace with those around them. People come, they need help from the Jew that's in the time of Jacob's trouble. They say, here, I'll give you these things. Depart in peace. It's an action that they have to do. They don't automatically get it because of their relationship to the Lord, like we as Christians do today. It's a different setup. But what about 1 Peter? Now, I believe that the book of 1 Peter, 1 and 2 Peter, Peter is the apostle to the Jews, Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. Peter Going to the Jews, there's a lot of things that, that are there very true for church age, you know, Christians in the church age. Um, but there's also some overlap where some of his instructions are going to be kind of overlap and go over towards uh, the Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble. But uh, let's, let's see about this. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit and obedience and sprinkling of blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Hmm. Sounds very much like what Paul was writing. See? So you have Peter going to the Jews, and he's giving them the same kind of a promise that Paul was giving to the Gentiles. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. <clears throat> For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. So again, see, you're seeing that thing of back in chapter 1, verse 2, it sounds like the promise given to a Christian about God giving them peace. But here in chapter 3, verses uh, 10 and 11, it's like that action thing of a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble where they're going to, you know, uh, let him seek peace and ensue it. An interesting thing. First Peter chapter 5, verse 14. It says here, Greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Again, sounds like what Paul is promising to uh, you know Gentile Christians. Now go to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Again, you see that kind of a blending of, of the thing that's true for a Christian, but also for a saint in the time of Jacob's trouble. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. <clears throat> Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye, may be, that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. So again, seeing some of that thing of 
somewhat towards a Christian, <clears throat> but also towards a saint in the time of Jacob's trouble. <clears throat> um, book of Second John, the second epistle of John, <clears throat> verse 3. Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, the Son of the Father in truth and love. So again, it sounds very much like the Pauline epistles. You know, peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Third John, the third epistle of John, uh, chapter 1, only one chapter, verse 14. But I trust I shall see thee, and we shall speak face to face. Peace be to thee, our friends salute thee, greet, greet the friends by name. So you see, peace be to thee. We're going over the, the you know, scriptures here, leading up to something here, so stick with me. Jude. Again, there's only one chapter, so verse 1 and 2. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ, and called, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. So you have peace there. You know, upon them. Um, Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 through 5. Let's read that. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Okay, so again, you see there the thing of peace being to you from the Lord. John's writing to churches and things, and I know you can make some arguments one way or the other. Who are the seven churches? Are they, you know, you know, seven literal churches in the first century? Uh, or is their application to the time of Jacob's trouble? You know, we're not going to get into all that stuff there. But let's look at the final reference to the word peace. Revelation chapter 6, verse 4. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. Okay? Now, peace is what's promised to a Christian. We have covered that. We have proved that thoroughly at this point in time. And I'm going to be showing you a little bit more, too, on the thing of peace being in the life of a Christian. So, how does that work? Peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. But here, verse 4, Revelation 6, verse 4, uh, peace is taken when Jesus Christ opens the seal. The red horse goes, rider goes out and takes peace from the earth. There. You know, to take peace from the earth. Now, somebody could make the argument that when peace is taken from the earth, maybe that's a reference to the rapture. We have peace that passeth understanding. The Lord gives us peace. Peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. He takes peace from the earth. Maybe the red horse rider catches us away. Uh, no, that's not going to work. Because uh, it's the Lord Jesus Christ that comes for his bride. It's not the red horse rider. And you say, well, what's this peace here? You know, And if, and if that was true, by the way, uh, the posties would definitely have their system messed up because... Uh, they're trying to teach that you're here to the sixth uh, seal. So that would kind of ruin that little theory. But what's this peace in relation to? This peace is talking about physical peace down here. It's not the spiritual peace that comes upon a Christian when they get saved. It's talking about physical peace. Let me show you that. Matthew chapter 10 Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 through 36. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Hmm. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Okay. Now, how does that work? 
you have the Lord Jesus Christ saying, uh, in the Pauline epistles, we have peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. But here Jesus says, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. Well, then how's that work? Isn't that a contradiction? No, it's no contradiction. Because what Jesus Christ is talking about here, he's talking about the thing of all people. Okay? Physical peace on this earth. The Lord brought, he didn't come to bring that peace and make things peaceful here so everybody can get along. That's what he's saying here. It's not talking about the peace that comes upon you as a Christian when you get saved. Well, what do we read there earlier about the king of Salem, which means king of peace? Well, there's another passage which is rather interesting. If you want to go back to Isaiah chapter 9, where Jesus is called the prince of peace. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 through 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, get a hold of that one, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end, upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it, with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Okay? So, right there, Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. He's also called the King of Peace. Hmm. But now let's look about what we're promised as Christians. John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verse 22. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and he will come, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. You can't have a relationship with God if you don't believe the Bible. Simple. He, lo he that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which he heard is, hears not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you. The King of Peace, what's he say? Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Let me ask you a question. What would you think if I stood here and I said, um, Brothers and sisters in Christ, I have to be honest with you. Um, I've been teaching you a lie the whole time. There is no rapture. Um, we're going into the Great Tribulation. You know, we're going into it. Um, you better start stockpiling food because you're not going to be able to buy or sell soon. Um, most of us are going to have our heads cut off. Um, could you hear that and say, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid? How is it that we can have peace? You say, well, Christians have been persecuted in the past, the martyrs and all that other stuff. Yeah, but it wasn't God that was doing it to them. When you hear about tribulation and things like that, bad things happening to you, it's the lost world doing it to you. The book of Revelation is God doing it to man. Every single part of it. The seals, it's Jesus Christ opening those seals, and it's Him sending out that judgment. Now, how can you have peace as a Christian? Down here, peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, here comes the war. What's happening? Oh, my, my Jesus... Prince of Peace, he's sending it upon me. Hmm. So what do we see there? Verse 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So if we have people who believe that they're going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble, and they're 
worried about it, a little bit sick and things like this. And I, I wish the pre-trib rapture was true, but it's not. And all this other stuff. And I'm a little scared, but it's okay. They don't have the peace of God. I'll say it to you another way. They're lost. You see, there are certain things at salvation. When you get saved, the Lord will give you certain things. He'll give you His Spirit. And that's why I said in my study, and I will stand by it as long as I live, Christians don't swear. You get saved, and all of a sudden you get real vexed when you hear profanity. And if one slips out of your mouth when you make a mistake, some people don't get that. They didn't hear that part of my study apparently, or they're, the devil's just you know talked or something, so they didn't hear me saying it. But, you know, Christians will mess up. Absolutely. I don't teach sinless perfection. But you get a Christian that swears, they're going to go, Oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Oh, Lord, I'm sorry. You're not going to feel good about swearing. It's going to be vexing to you. You're going to feel dirty after you do it. You know? Some of you, you write me and say, Oh, brother, you got to check out this comment. Or, you know, these comments down here. in the they're, they're writing all kinds of filthy cuss words. Why would you be offended by that? You know? Because you have the Holy Spirit. You understand? I mean, these enemies of mine out there that, you know, saying I'm all this stuff, oh, how dare you speak against cussing Christians, whatever. What would you do if I stood up here and started swearing like crazy? Just got an angry rant. I'm just, you bleep, 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 bleep. And I just start cussing up a blue streak. You know what happened? There'd be countless Brian Denley or exposed videos all over the internet. Look at a preacher. Look at him cussing and stuff like this. They would judge me, but I turn around and judge them, and it's inappropriate and everything else. And I'm adding works to salvation. I'm a lordship salvationist and all this other stuff. Things change when you get saved. And one of the things that changes is you will have peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ as a Christian. So somebody starts coming around with their doom and gloom to you and everything else and telling you, you're going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. There's a good chance that you're not going to make it. You might take the mark of the beast and then you're going to go to hell and all this other stuff. And you start to get troubled. You know why? Because it's not from God. John chapter 16, verse 33. I want to continue to prove it. John chapter 16, verse 33. These things I have I excuse me, these things I have spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. Paul promised that? Yeah. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And again, that's why this little slick move of these guys, they say, you're going to go into the tribulation. It's the tribulation. Uh, the tribulation is never used as a title for that coming time period. And I know we have to use it and stuff because, you know, it's this whole thing. If you don't say pre-trib rapture, people go, what's that mean? And all this other stuff. But the fact of the matter is, I have for years now said about the tribulation or the rapture or whatever else, and then I will correct it with the true biblical term because there's always new people coming along and I have to try and say that so people understand what I'm saying. You will have tribulation in your life as a Christian. Again, it's so funny. Posties, these, these people that believe the, the church has to go through this final purification time, they all talk about, oh, we have it so easy. Things are so nice now, but it's going to get bad. Then our faith is going to be tried. And I'm going, okay, um, uh, Bible-believing Christians I know have it rough now. And our faith is tried right now. And you're saying you're not feeling any of that? You're not vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked? You know, you're not vexed with the music out there? You're not vexed with everything else that's going on in the world? It's not bothering you? It's not the trial of your faith right now. You're looking for it to come out there in the future. They're lost, brethren. These people that stand for the, the what they would call the post-trib rapture or whatever else, they're lost. They're not saved. They don't have that peace from God. That's why they're not feeling any tribulation or anything bad going on in the world right now. I mean, you know... I know Christians, brethren, and I've been through it plenty of times myself. There are days when it is just all that you can take to just to, just to survive the day. The spiritual onslaught, the, the attacks that come upon you, the fear, the doubt, the, the horrible thoughts entering into your mind, and you're just, oh, I'm so vexed, and you go to the store, and there's this 
terrible music from your past and you're just like Ugh. and you hear people swearing and it just you know i was this close to telling some guy off just not long ago we're at this store and uh in the area here and and uh this i heard this guy and he used the f word in the store and i and i just like i looked over at him and he was he was walking the other way and i thought you know i'm like standing here with my wife and my little boy my three-year-old son you know and the guy just uses the f word and stuff that vexes me and if he had stand there you know cussing up a storm i would have gone over and told the guy off and say hey you know there's women and children present would you mind watching your language but I guess I'm not being a Christian because I, I condemn people that swear, you know. You know, what a, what a weird, you know, <laughs> topsy-turvy world, you know, bizarro land here, you know, where a Christian preacher condemns profanity and he gets called a false convert by people that defend profanity. Cussing Christians are on their way to heaven, but Christians like myself that don't swear, that have a clean mouth, I mean, look at all my videos, I've never cussed one time, and I'm lost, but they're saved. Okay, <laughs> sure. John chapter 20. John chapter 20, verse 19 through 26. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, that's Sunday, to you Sabbath people out there, uh, and I don't mean Jews, I'm talking about, you know, the Seventh-day Adventists and all the little wingnuts like that, people that pretend that they're Jews and they're not. Uh, synagogue of Satan, they're called in Revelation 2, 5 and Revelation 3, 5. So. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. Jesus promises them peace. You see it? First time. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be, and I don't mean the peace, the hippie thing there. You know, do it this way. Um, peace, where am I at here? I lost my place. Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. Hmm. And when he had uh, said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other, the other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the, the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe." Verse 26, And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Three times he says, Peace unto you. Hmm. Then you have Paul showing up later, and he says, Peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says, My peace I leave with you. Peace is the mark of a truly saved Christian. You'll go through the tribulations of this life, but you can always go back and have that peace. The blessed hope that's coming and an understanding of that. Go next to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Are you getting it? The Prince of Peace brings peace into your life. Jesus Christ, the King of Peace. Are you one of his uh, subjects? One of his bondservants? Is he your Lord? Your King? Then you have peace. If you don't have peace, you don't have Jesus. You know, there's an old, old sign. I've seen different things. of Bible buildings will put it on their sign that says, No peace, N-O, peace, N-O, Jesus. No, K-N-O-W, 
no peace, K-N-O-W, no Jesus. Yeah, or excuse me, it's no Jesus, no peace, no Jesus, no peace. You know, like that. And it's true. It's absolutely true. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18. Let's read that quick here. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. God thinks very highly of lost men, you know. But look at verse 17. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Interesting tie in there. The way of peace have they not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Mm -hmm. um, the world's peace is all false. Here we'll give you this uh, drug called ecstasy. It'll just make you feel totally just at peace, man. You know, here's the hippie drugs and stuff, the hippie movement. Here's smoke this marijuana, man. It'll just trip you out, man. It'll just make you feel so peaceful and calm. Yeah, it'll destroy your brain. You smoke that stuff and smoke that stuff and smoke that stuff, it starts to destroy your brain. My dad was a paramedic for 30 years, I think it was, and he talked about the, the potheads and stuff like this, and they just their mental cognition is gone and, and everything else. And I, you know, oh, what if you eat it, and what if you this, and what if you that, and this different type of thing here, and what? It, I don't even mess with stuff like that. I don't want to mess with stuff like that. My peace comes from Jesus Christ and from His Word. But they come up with all kinds of different ways of peace. I'll go to this resort; it's so peaceful. Uh, go out to this mountain cabin; it's so peaceful there. Um, listen to this special New Age music; it's peaceful. Um, burn these essential oils and, and take this prescription medication and whatever else. It's all peace. And yet, through all of it, the way of peace have they not known. What is the way of peace? I remember somebody said, uh, Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John chapter 14, verse 6. Um, the way of peace have they not known. The Prince of Peace, the King of Peace. My peace I leave with thee, Jesus Christ says. Let not, not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Do you have fear of what's going on in the world? Are you afraid of what's coming to this world? You don't have Jesus. It's quite simple. Turn back in your Old Testament to Isaiah chapter 57. Isaiah 57 verse 19 through 21. I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him that is far off and to him that is near, saith the Lord, and I will heal him. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God to the wicked. Mm -hmm. They have no peace. That's why they're like the uh, troubled sea, cannot rest. That's why lost people go out and they build mansions. Do you ever wonder why these lost people build these huge giant mansions, live in them for a few years, and then they go and build another one, sell the previous one? You wonder why they can't have enough cars, fast cars, motorcycles, Hollywood actors, you know, marrying this person, divorcing, marrying, marrying this one, having children to that one, so they're... They're like the troubled sea, which cannot rest. Swish, 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 splash, crash, swish, swish. I want to get a new car. I'm going to build another house. 
I think I'm going to date somebody else. I think maybe a divorce is in order. I think maybe I oh, I'll have a child of this one. I think I'm going to go to France this weekend for a thing here, and I'm going to go to here, and I'm going to there. Swish, swish, swish. There's no peace. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Hmm. There's a condition put on you as a Christian if you want to live in peace. What is it? You can't live like the lost world. You can't be carnally minded. You can't seek to please the flesh. You have to seek to please the Lord. And when you do, you'll have peace. That's why I preach against sin, brethren. And I say, you know, I'm, I'm trying to spur people into righteousness. Purify your life. If you're struggling with sin, get it out of your life. You're being carnal. All right? If you're a Bible-believing Christian and you're writing all the different doctrines and things like that, but you're messing around a lot, watching television or listening to the wrong kind of music or, or wrong kind of entertainment, whatever else, you don't have peace. You're being carnally minded. And so I preach against that stuff and I say, you need to get that stuff out of your life. And if you don't have any conviction about it, you might not be saved. I'm trying to spur people into righteousness. I'm spur trying to make sure that there's no false converts out there. You know, I'm going to warn you. I'm a preacher. I preach against sin. That's what I'm supposed to do. And the false converts out there, they get all upset about that. And, oh, he's, you know, adding all this stuff to salvation and whatever else. It's absurd. Completely absurd. Doesn't matter how many times I explain myself. They just keep twisting my words. But some people have their life, I guess. Romans chapter 10, verse 14 and 15. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him uh, of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I'm imploring you to do so today. Come to the Lord. When you get saved, then you can start to live with the realization that the Antichrist is coming and the New World Order is coming and you're going to get your head chopped off. And, you know, if you don't get your head chopped off and you take the mark of the beast, then all the love and everything else that God had for you and that you're in the bride and everything else, you're, you're part of the body of Christ, that's all gone because you took the mark of the beast. And now you're going to go to hell and you're going to burn forever because you tried to provide for your family by taking the mark of the beast you see, and God had to damn you to hell forever. Happy times. Excuse me. Uh, preach the gospel of priest and bring glad tidings of good things. Now let me actually do it as a real Bible-believing Christian does it. Okay? The gospel of peace. Jesus Christ loved you as a sinner. You don't have to clean up your life and be a good, a good person to get into God's good favor. You come to Him as a broken, rotten, filthy, contrite sinner. The worst of the worst. Come to Jesus Christ. He'll save you. Put your faith in Him and the blood that He shed on the cross. He'll pay for everything. It's like having some massive debt that you can't possibly pay and somebody comes along and says, I got it. The police are there, they got you handcuffed, you're about ready to go to jail for this big debt and you're going to be there for the rest of your life and some guy comes along and says, oh, no, don't put him in prison. I'll pay the whole thing. That's what salvation is. The Lord Jesus Christ pays for the whole thing, pays for your entire rotten lost life and then he gives you a new life and he tells you, hey, don't do that. Hey, do this. Here, son or daughter, I'm going to change you this here. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to teach you my ways. And guess what? You say, well, brother, I'm, I'm, I'm really messed up. I, or Brian, you're not saved and you're not my brother. But if you say, I'm really, really messed up, things are really kind of bad and whatever else, and I don't, even if the Lord saves me, I, I still, I'm, I have some real problems and I'm, health is problems and, you know, I got, everything is just falling apart. 
okay, what if I told you that, uh, and you say the world's falling apart, everything's bad, okay? You get saved as a rotten sinner, it doesn't end there. There's going to come a point in time when the Lord's going to catch away His bride before His judgment comes down to this earth. What is that? The gospel of peace. Jesus says, my peace I leave with you because He's the King of peace, the Prince of peace. And bring glad tidings of good things, good news. With all the geoengineering and the genetically modified foods and the, and the bees and the bugs are being killed by the genetically modified crops in the fields and things like this and the wars that are coming and all the rioting and race wars and, and everything else. Guess what? Here's some glad tidings. We're going to be leaving. Does that bring you peace? Or does it trouble your heart? See, brethren, the thing of the Lord Jesus Christ being peace, literally, He is truth personified. He is also peace personified. That gets kind of deep and you go, wow, that, that's interesting. How could that be? And, and, you, and you look at that and things and the mystery of, Godhead, of the Godhead is great. The mystery of godliness is great. I'll say it that way. Um, you know, sure, absolutely. But you know what? It's just a basic thing as well that you can understand this. When God saves you, He's going to do good things for you. No matter how bad it gets on the earth, you can still have peace. There's glad tidings. You're living in some cesspool, some horrible place that you can't get out of and you don't have any money and, and you just, you, you've been on drugs and you've been just whatever and you've fornicated and you've done other bad things. Jesus Christ will save you. And on top of that, He'll take you to a place soon probably and you get out of this wicked world and everything else. He'll take you to a place where the streets are gold. Perfect health. Perfect everything. No more sorrow, no more pain. Does that bring you peace? Brings me peace. Times I've gone through some really, really rough times and there's sometimes all I've had to cling on to is that blessed hope. I know He's going to take me away soon. And you start thinking about it and you just close your eyes and you imagine and you say, what's it going to be like? What's that day going to be doing? What am I going to be doing when that time happens? Going to read something and all of a sudden and you hear your name being called and you hear, come up hither. Boom. You're gone. In a moment, the twinkling of an eye. Just like that. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Okay, actually, you're going to get an incorruptible body at that point in time. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 58 proves that. And up you go. No more debts. No more headaches. No more back pain. No more sickness. No more whatever. It's all over. In a moment, the twinkling of an eye. Does it give you peace? Then you're saved. I don't re believe that. I, I reject all that. I don't believe in the pre-trib rapture. I don't believe that... The, I, I think the church has to go through it. Then you don't have peace. Which means you don't have Jesus. Jesus is the resurrection. Now you show me anywhere in the gospel accounts where the dead saints are coming up at His second coming. It's not there. And yet... You know, well, I'll say it this way. It's not there in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, Luke 21. It's not there. But when you get to the book of John, Jesus Christ talking to you know, um, Martha, I think it is, and he's saying about you know, Lazarus and stuff, and he says, you know, I am the resurrection and the life. He talks about, you know, um, let me go there real quick. I don't want to try to quote this. This is not in my notes. It's just kind of popping into my head here. And I'm going to talk about this for just a minute. But I don't want to misquote scripture and quote a lot of it, but uh, sometimes my mind is on other things and I kind of trip myself up. <laughs> um, John chapter 11, um, verse 24. Actually, we'll go to verse 23. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Look what Jesus says. Jesus saith unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. 
He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die, believest thou this. Dead and living saints in Jesus Christ. He's the resurrection. He is our peace. Doesn't that excite you as a Christian? What if it's tonight? What if the Lord decides, hey, I'm going to just, tonight's the night. The old uh, thing, perhaps today. The little trumpet thing and stuff, I've seen these bumper stickers, perhaps today. Brings you peace, doesn't it? Maybe we'll get to go to see one another, body of Christ, reunited with, you know, lost, or, well, loved ones that are, that are not lost, I'll say that. I'm thinking lost as in they're, they're dead and gone, but, you know, Saved loved ones. How about today? How about some of you brothers out there that have lost your wives? Love the Lord and everything else? I know there's a couple of you out there that you've lost your wife. She's with the Lord right now. Wouldn't you like to see her tonight? Does that bring you peace? Some of you out there lost children? Do you have the peace of Jesus? Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14, verse 17 through 19. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. The greatest edification that there is, brethren, is the resurrection. The time when we get to leave all of this behind and go to see Jesus Christ face to face. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. What is your hope if you believe that Christians go through the time of Jacob's trouble? What's your hope? Hopefully you can endure to the end. <laughs> Hopefully you can find some place where you get food and you don't have to take the mark to get it. What kind of hope is that? Hopefully somehow when God sends all the bad things that are going to come to this earth, hopefully somehow I might be able to kind of get through that. When peace is taken from the earth with the red horse rider, hopefully we can somehow hide out in the mountains or something like this. That's not any kind of hope at all. It's not the blessed hope that the Bible talks about. Posties have no hope. Romans chapter 15, verse 32 and 33. That I may come unto you with joy by the will of God and may with you be refreshed. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Um, Jesus is the Prince of Peace and the King of Peace. Now it says the God of peace. You think that might be the same? One and the same? Peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ? Yeah. You get it? Well, if you're lost, you don't. Romans chapter 16, verse 19 through 20. For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would not, or yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The spirit, or excuse me, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ it be with you. Amen. Trying to read through the thing here, <laughs> tripping up over my words. I'm, you know, so many thoughts in my mind right now about this whole thing. It just, you know, even just even I'm I'm trying to preach. I'm trying to stick with my notes and stuff. And it's just like the mention of whenever I start talking about the rapture, Lord brings stuff into my mind, and it's just like I start talking about it, and it's just like it diverts my mind, and it's all I'm thinking about now. I'm just thinking about going to be with the Lord and going to see, you know, people that I've respected in the body of Christ, and you know. 
my brothers and sisters in Christ and things. And no more of the YouTube trolls and everything else. They'll be down on the earth. Praise the Lord. You know, and just, oh, it's going to be so awesome. It's going to be amazing. You know, it brings me peace. It brings me joy. Just don't understand how you can call yourself a Christian and think that you're going to go into a time when God's going to pour out his wrath and judgment on you. It doesn't make any sense to me. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. If you're an older Christian, Posties want you to believe that uh, you've lived for the Lord and, and lived for 50, 60 years for the Lord or whatever else. You're in your 60s or in your 70s or whatever else. Posties want you to believe that you could lose it all. Antichrist shows up, Mark of the Beast, you know, and you'd take it and whatever else because you'd want to buy or whatever else and things and you lose the whole thing <laughs> uh, Lord's not going to do that 2nd Corinthians chapter 13 verse 11 body of Christ is going to be gone long before that time happens finally brethren farewell be perfect be of comfort be of one mind live in peace and the God of love and peace shall be with you You're not going to live in peace if you believe that you're going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. It's, in, it's impossible. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23, the fruit of the Spirit here, says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Do you have the fruit of the Spirit? My peace I leave with you, Jesus says. So you can have Jesus, but you don't have peace. Doesn't make any sense. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes uh, were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. Jesus is our peace. Who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us having abolished in the, his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Jesus Christ is king of peace, peace, and a Christian is part of the body of Christ. We're one flesh with Jesus Christ. Then why wouldn't you have peace? When the time of Jacob's trouble comes up and things and and uh, the Lord's going to be up there in heaven just beating himself up or something. So what are you doing? I'm just beating on the body of Christ. Needs to be purified. Bam, bam, wham. <laughs> A little strange. Verse 16. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. But ye have no peace." Because we're going to go into the time, and it, you know it's going to be pretty bad. And we're going to, you know, peace is going to be taken from the earth. Revelation chapter six, verse four, and Christians are going to be there after that. It's not possible. Again, another irrefutable proof that the body of Christ is gone before the Antichrist shows up. Irrefutable, cannot be any other way. And there's even brethren that I respect and things like that that kind of just dabble around and just kind of twist the scriptures a little bit. Well, I think that we'll be here when the Antichrist is revealed, but then I think that we're going to leave shortly after. The... Sorry, you're wrong. You're heretical in what you're saying. You might be saved, but you're heretical in what you're saying. The body of Christ is gone before the Antichrist shows up. Now, 
Next go to Ephesians chapter 4. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Yes, we are supposed to be different as Christians. There's supposed to be something different about us. We have peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 4. Here's a real good one. You know, it's funny because I've seen how the Lord is in control of everything and He'll, He'll speak truth sometimes through the mouth of posties. You'll see what I'm talking about here in just a minute. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We'll come back to that. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Hmm. Verse 7, the peace of God which passeth all understanding. The Lord plays a little joke on these people that refuse to accept the truth. They say, I just don't understand how people can still believe in the pre-trib rapture. I just don't understand how people can think that they get out of here before the great tribulation. Uh, yeah, you see what they're doing is actually telling the truth. They don't understand it. Why? <clears throat> the peace of God which passeth all understanding. They don't understand it. The lost world can't see it. You see, the lost world thinks we have it good now. It's easy to be a Christian right now because they're just faking it. They look like the world. They act like the world. They think like the world. A lot of things. Sure. False converts. They don't understand what it's like to actually have tribulation right now as a Christian. They don't suffer anything. Most of these guys, these you know, crazy posties and stuff like that, most of them are childhood converts. You know, I got saved at a very young age. Again, I'll just, I'll just issue that out there for, as a public challenge to these posties. Tell us your testimony. Show us the before and after of when you got saved. A lot of them can't do that because they profess to have been saved at a very young age. A young age when they couldn't have possibly understood what they were doing. Call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. They couldn't understand that. They couldn't understand all the ramifications of everything and I've sinned against God, a holy, righteous God and, and whatever. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. How can you understand the law as a little child? They can't. That's why they look and they say, I don't understand how you can fall for this rapture stuff. I don't understand this. Because they don't have the peace of God. It passes their understanding. They don't get it. They think that things are you know, okay now but going to get bad in the future. Bible believers looking to say, no, it's actually really bad in my life right now. I'm sure looking forward to that blessed hope. I'm sure looking forward to that time. You know, it gives me peace to know that I'm going to be caught up before God's wrath comes. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Isn't it interesting, as I said earlier in the study, lost people try to fake peace? All this hippie stuff, the peace, 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 and all this other stuff. 
They're looking for peace and safety and sudden destruction comes upon them. Why? Because peace is caught up. The body of Christ, King of Peace, Prince of Peace, my peace I leave with you. See how scripture ties together? We have peace through our Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace. It's here. that it passeth understanding. And all of a sudden, the Lord says, come up hither. And up goes the body of Christ. And all that's left on this earth is people trying to fake peace. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. Second Thessalonians, I'm sorry, First Thessalonians, excuse me, I missed I skipped a passage here. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse fourteen. Looked over at my notes. Sorry about that. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse fourteen through twenty three. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings, prove all, all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. It sounds like a lot of commandments there for a Christian. Yeah, why? Verse 23, And the very God of peace, Sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's good advice right there, brethren. Verse 14 down through verse 23. It's a list that you need to do. You want to be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you want to purify your life and get ready for Jesus Christ, His soon return, or His bride? You want to get yourself ready to meet the bridegroom? That's what you do, verse 14 down through verse 23. Go down through that list and say, okay, pray without ceasing. Are you praying without ceasing? And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Are you doing that? Prove all things. Are you doing that? Are you studying? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2, 15. Are you doing that? Hold fast that which is good. Are you holding fast to the things that are good? Are you being, you know, I use the word stubborn in jest. You know, I know stubbornness is a sin in things, but I'm being, I'm saying it sarcastically. Are you going to move from your position of holding to the King James Bible? You know, and you go to verse 14 and 15. I wasn't trying to skip over them or anything, but the point is you go down through these verses here. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. You want peace in life? You want to retain that blessed hope in your mind and things? Then you purify your life. You say, you know what? I want to be ready for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back. If he comes tonight, I want to be ready for that. I want to go through and have him tell me, hey, that thing there needs to go. This thing over here, you really shouldn't have that in your home. Purify your life. It's important. Finally, now we'll go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16 through 18. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. The Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. Do you have peace? Can you look out into the future and say, boy, I can't wait. You know, there is a danger with uh, understanding about the rapture being before the, or the catching away, try to correct, use the right terms, the catching away being before the time of Jacob's trouble. And that is you can become very, rather narcissistic and just kind of like go through life and extremely pessimistic and well, I'm not going to bother doing anything because Lord's coming back soon and the world's getting worse and worse. And, and you can get, you know, kind of miserable, quite frankly. 
And I've done it. I've done it in my life. And uh, I'm looking for the Lord. I'll never, ever give up on the hope, the blessed hope. I can't wait for the rapture. But I'm starting to learn to give thanks and to be thankful for what the Lord's doing in my life. And, you know, uh, I'm actually starting to enjoy my life and take pleasure in the things that the Lord gives us and pleasure in, in my son's laughter and pleasure in the snow falling from the sky and looking out in the beautiful, everything's white and pleasure in good food. God's given me peace. I don't have to look at the world and say, oh no, oh, they're, they're building the embassy in, in Jerusalem and oh, this is going to lead to war. Oh, it's going to be bad. It's going to be the Antichrist. He's going to show up any day and then, oh, it's going to be so bad. He's gonna, right, my head's going to get cut off. Oh, oh. I hope I don't you know, get tempted and take the mark of the beast. I, I could lose it and things and... What, what if I taken the mark of the beast already? If I mean my ATM card, it has my name on it and has a number. And what if I already took the number? And... I have peace. I know the Lord. Do you know the Lord? Glad tidings of good things. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Romans chapter 8 verse 28. Can you believe that if you're a postie? Nope. You can't believe that. You're going to be facing God's judgment as a Christian, being part of his body. Isn't that weird? You know, according to their teaching, you know, it's messed up. I have peace because I have Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is peace. I'm part of his body. Therefore, I have peace as well. Peace is going to be caught up one of these days because peace is Jesus Christ. And Christ's church, His body, we are one flesh. Like we read earlier there, we're one in body to make it Himself twain one new man. So making peace if you're part of Jesus Christ, you have peace. If you're not part of Jesus Christ, you don't have peace. Just as simple as that. Um, a lot of people out there, like I said, it's just getting worse and worse. People attacking me, attacking this ministry, and they, they I guess, want me to be more ambiguous and things like this, and, and I shouldn't be so dogmatic about knowing the truth and believing the truth and preaching the truth. I'm not going to do that. Um... But what you need to do out there is you need to get your salvation figured out. Get your relationship figured out with the Lord. Uh, somebody comes along and they tell you, oh, you just pray this little prayer, or you just believe that He died on the cross for you and stuff like that. And you say, well, I've done that, whatever, but I still have these feelings and I still have this and I still... Let me tell you something. There's nothing more important in this world, in this life, than you getting your salvation figured out. No amount of good works are going to do it. You've got to get to the point where you're broken. And you come to the Lord and you say, I want peace in my life. I don't have peace. I need to know you personally. And I don't care about my job. I don't care about my family. I don't care about my relationships. I don't care about anything in this world. I want the peace that passeth understanding. I want to know Jesus Christ. I want to know that I'm going to go to heaven when I die. I want that assurance of salvation. You can watch our salvation message. I'm not monetized. I don't make a cent off of it. <laughs> this channel is not monetized. Uh, it's one of the few that isn't. Okay. Um, you can watch the salvation message. It'll take you through the scriptures <clears throat> and show you what the Bible says, how to be saved. Um, it's simple. It really is. You just have to come to the end of yourself. Your righteousness is never going to get you saved. It's the way it is. So, that's going to be it. Again, another proof of the catching away of the bride of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. Can't wait for it. So, um, got a bunch of other videos and things here I'm writing notes for. Going to be doing, I know I had a brother request a thing of the uh, vehicle 
testimony. Going to be doing that coming up soon. Um, the review of the big, uh, it's sitting over here, the big, real big 1611 King James Bible that the brother sent me. Um, so we'll get to that. I got to set up my overhead camera thing and everything else. Uh, so it takes a little bit of time, but I'll get that done. And uh, But please do keep us in your prayers. And thank you to all those who donate to the ministry. Again, it keeps us going. I appreciate that. Um, you know, again, if you're new to this ministry, um, we do everything here for free. Uh, well, I've never charged for any of the videos I put out on YouTube. I used to sell DVDs. That was a thing I used to do, but there was issues there and things like that. Again, I'm not going to get into all that, but um, everything I do is free. Um, I, you know, write back and forth with a lot of people and things like that, and and um, there, this channel is not monetized. Again, I've proved that in other videos. We don't make a cent from any of our videos. If you see an ad on the one of my videos, it's because I have music, and I keep dealing with this thing with YouTube. They'll put copyright claims on my videos, even though I own the license um, from the copyright holder to use the music in my productions. And uh, so it's a constant battle with YouTube over that whole thing, but we do not monetize our videos here. Um, so people want to give to the ministry. They want to give a donation to the ministry. We greatly appreciate that. It's completely of people's free choice. Um, if you want to give a, a gift to the ministry because you've been blessed, great. If you don't, well... Give your money to somebody out there serving the Lord. All right. You don't. If you don't give it here, then give it to somebody else. Okay. Because your money's not going with you. All right. So do something for the Lord before He catches you away. Okay. Uh, so that is going to be it, and I guess we'll see you in the next video. Thank you for watching.